I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Stuart Hameroff, an anesthesiologist and professor at the University of Arizona, author of the book Ultimate Computing, and lead organizer of the biannual Science of Consciousness Conference. Dr. Hameroff is known for his role as the co-founder of the Orchestrated Object Reduction Model of Consciousness, which he developed in conjunction with physicist Sir Roger Penrose in the early 90s. So, Stuart, welcome, sir. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Tim. Good to see you. So, for the uninitiated, I want to start out by asking you about microtubules in cells. Uh, what are they, and what role do they traditionally play inside of our body cells? The microtubules inside all of our cells are part of the cytoskeleton, the skeletal system of our cells, cells which give structural support. So asymmetrical cells like neurons that have very long processes need microtubules to keep them intact. Uh, so they're the structural support, and that's the conventional uh, view of them. However, I came to believe many, many years ago that they were also the nervous system of the cell, and they were processing information, organizing things uh, mechanically, structurally, and also intelligence-wise and possibly consciousness. So I started out studying them in mitosis and cell divisions where they pull the chromosomes apart and began wondering how they knew where to go and what to do and whether they had some intelligence or even consciousness at that level. And that's what got me interested uh, 50 years ago. Well, yeah, I, I was actually going to go to that next because your interest in these possible computational capabilities of microtubules goes back to 1972. So this was early in your career. Um, so what was it that sparked your interest in it back then? And what was what was it that caused the idea to kind of stick with you, I guess, over time? Right. Well, I had uh, I was an undergrad uh, pre-med at University of Pittsburgh, and, and I wanted to go to medical school. And I took a philosophy of mind class, which I liked a lot, got me thinking. And uh, and then uh, none of the, uh, so I was oriented toward the brain mind uh, thing. And uh, so thinking of neurology, psychiatry, neurosurgery. It's a medical specialty, but none of those lifestyles appeal to me. And uh, so I did a research elective in a in a cancer lab and studied mitosis, uh, cell division, how the chromosomes uh, are separated by these structures called microtubules, and they have to do it perfectly or else you get an abnormal uh, uh, genotype and uh, maldevelopment or cancer or something bad. So it has to be quite precise. And uh, everybody else in the lab got interested in the chromosomes, it seemed, this was the dawn of the genetic uh, revolution. And uh, I don't know what happened to them. They probably uh, made billions in, in uh, genetics and stuff. But uh, I got interested in the uh, in the problem of how these uh, microtubules knew, knew where to go and what to do and that they might process uh, information. And at that time, it was discovered that others, that all cells, including neurons, were full of microtubules. And the, the fixative agent in electron microscopy had for 30 years been actually dissolving the microtubules. So if you looked inside a cell, you saw like a minestrone soup of stuff floating around. And that's still how many people think of it. But actually, when a guy named Keith Porter at Harvard changed from osmium tetroxide to glutaraldehyde fixation, for electron microscopy, all of a sudden, all the structure was there. And then they argued, well, the structure is an artifact of the fixation. And But after a while, they realized, no, these are real. These are uh, microtubules, actin, other cytoskeletal structures. And also at about the same time, uh, Amos and Klug in the UK had discovered the X-ray crystallography of microtubules. And they looked like they were a lattice, a, a hexagonal lattice. Uh, and I had just started looking at how computers work. This was uh, also new to me in the early 70s. And um, I was looking at things like Boolean switching matrices and cellular automata and things like that. And it occurred to me that the individual, so microtubules are polymers of a protein called tubulin, a peanut shaped protein. And uh, if you make a chain of the tubulins and they have 13 of these chains and you, you make a cylinder and that's a microtubule and it self assembles from tubulin and forms the cell. It, it's almost magical. I asked, uh, embryology professor, well, how do they do that? And he, and he said, you know, it's like the Indian rope trick. The guy throws the rope up the air, uh, climbs up the rope and disappears in the clouds. And that's how it works. I, he was joking, but he was telling me that nobody knew and that the microtubules did it somehow. And that's all I can say. So I figured, well, they had to be processing information and forming synapses and, and growing neurons and stuff like that. 
And so looking at Boolean switching matrices, I thought that maybe they were processing information that could go up the protofilament or along the diagonals, since this was a hexagonal lattice. And that la led to a lot of uh, interesting possibilities. So um, anyway, I, I, uh, I went into anesthesiology uh, because my uh, uh, future chairman, a guy named Brunel Brown, told me that if I wanted to understand consciousness, I should understand how anesthesia works. And uh, he also handed me a paper by a friend of his in the UK that showed that anesthesia uh, depolymerized microtubules and had been proposed as a mechanism in the Lancet, uh, uh, um, British Medical Journal, that microtubule that anesthesia acted by depolymerizing your microtubules. Well, that turns out to take about five times the amount you need for anesthesia. So depolymerization per se is probably not what anesthesia does, fortunately, because that can uh, that can be bad. You can lose memory that way and if they don't uh, repolymerize perfectly. But uh, fortunately, uh, uh, you don't need that much. And um, and so I started. I went into anesthesia. Uh, Brunel told me that it was I could figure out consciousness. Uh, it was fun and pretty good money. And here I am. Uh, 48 years later, still uh, practicing anesthesia, although I'm about to retire. But um, so that got me into anesthesia and studying how anesthesia works. But I I kept up my interest in microtubules. And eventually, it looks like uh, anesthesia does act by by inhibiting microtubules, but more subtly than depolymerization. But um, in the 70s and 80s, I spent time looking at microtubules as information processing devices and modeling them with physicists like Steen Rasmussen and Jack Jasinski and others. Um, uh, to model them as cellular automata or molecular automata. Cellular automata, cell means an individual subunit. And we were saying that the microtubule, this, this individual subunit was the tubulin, which could change its shape or uh, flip a dipole. And so we modeled microtubules as uh, molecular automata and showed that the information processing inside a neuron is potentially much, much greater than AI and neuroscience people thought with one bit per neuron or per, per neuronal firing. So that got me a, on the idea that consciousness and intelligence went to a deeper level inside the neuron to the microtubules. I mean, if you look at a, a paramecium, it's one cell, uh, it swims around, it finds food, it finds a mate, it has sex, it can learn. It's one cell, it doesn't have any synapses, it's not part of a network. And it uses its cilia, its microtubule based structures to swim around, to sense things, and uh, and to find a mate and to have sex all um, without with only one cell using microtubules. So I figured, well, neurons have even more microtubules, and uh, they're in particular arrangements. They must be doing something relevant to consciousness. I thought, and that be got me started, and uh, and uh, here I am. Um, although what a uh, major thing happened in the, in the early '90s or late '80s, I I was going around being a pest at uh, uh, neural net and AI meetings, saying that. Your, uh, your target for information processing. They were saying, okay, 10 to the 11th neurons in the brain uh, with about a thousand synapses uh, at about a hundred Hertz gives you 10 to the 16th operations per second uh, for the human brain. That was the AI estimate. Uh, a guy named Hans Moravik in 1986 wrote a book called Mind Children, which was the first place I saw that number. And then uh, Kurzweil picked it up, and and that was the singularity. And when they got to ten to the sixteenth, they'd have brain equivalents. Therefore, consciousness, since they were saying consciousness is nothing more than computation, and you know, give us a few more billion, and we'll have a conscious computer based on ten to the sixteenth. And I was saying, no, no, no. If um, if you look inside the neuron, you got about a billion tubulins switching at say ten megahertz. That gives you ten to the sixteenth operations per second per neuron not the whole brain, and you have to multiply by the number of neurons, that was pushing their target, their goalposts way, way down downstream. So they didn't like that. I became yeah, pretty unpopular. Um, but then one day somebody said, okay, let's say you're right. How would that explain consciousness? And I didn't really have a good idea. It was just more reductionism. And uh, fortunately, he mentioned um, a book by Roger Penrose, The Emperor's New Mind, that I should read it because he had a mechanism for consciousness and he needed something maybe like what I was talking about. And so I did, and I was pretty much blown away by it and decided, and Roger had a mechanism for consciousness. He didn't have a structure. So I suggested microtubules and we teamed up and that was uh, 30 years ago and we're still going.
Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, and you know, you're running through my entire list of questions here. So I'm just like, <laughs> I, I have this big long list. I'm like, okay, he just answered that one and that one and that one and that one. But um, so the conventional model of the mind, again, this holds that signals are passed between neurons down synapses and mitigated by neurotransmitters. Right. And you already talked about that a moment ago. Um, it's, it's explained a bit like a computer, um, it, again, no one really understands how consciousness arises from it. This takes us back to, I believe, what's called the hard problem of consciousness, right? Where, um, you know, and so this orchestrated object reduction model or the orc or theory, this is the one that yourself and Sir Roger Penrose came up with. And you guys teamed up, you put the, the microtubules in line with um, his part of the theory. And that hopefully explains the consciousness aspect. And if I understand correctly, you're also saying that the microtubules perform some kind of a quantum processing, right? Right. Uh, Roger's idea was that you need a quantum collapse, a quantum state reduction uh, due to an objective threshold inherent in the universe to get consciousness. And this, uh, when I read his book, I, I was pretty blown away by it. Um, um, uh, the first half was about Gödel's theorem, arguing that... Um, uh, uh, Gödel's theorem basically says for a mathematical theorem to be proven, it needs something outside the theorem to prove it, like a, a mathematician, a, a system outside the intrinsic uh, computation. So uh, you need, a mathematician needs to judge that a, a theorem is, is true or not. The, the theorem can't prove itself. And Roger extended that to understanding and said that for us to understand something, um, we need something outside our computational system of neurons. And that must involve the quantum state uh, collapse, which was a solution to the me measurement problem, a whole nother mystery. So, you know, he was accused, he, we were both accused of, uh, uh, David Chalmers accused us of invoking the mythical law of minimization of mysteries, because we were using one mystery to solve another mystery. And uh, now Dave's kind of doing the same thing, but never mind about that. Um, and, uh, but what's wrong with that? You know, they could be the same mystery, and I think they are. And, um, I think that, uh, so the measurement problem is the problem of, you have superposition, quantum superpositions of small things that could be in multiple states or locations simultaneously. But when you make a measurement of them, when you look at them with a device or conscious observation, they collapse, or it seems they collapse or reduce to definite states. And so the early uh, quantum pioneers thought that, well, consciousness causes collapse of the wave function. And that led uh, Schrodinger to come up with this uh, famous uh, thought experiment of Schrodinger's cat of a cat, both dead and alive, until somebody looked at it to show how ridiculous the, the, this was. And uh, but it, it's it's still a mystery. You know, why don't we see superpositions? And uh, uh, do you need a conscious observer or does each possibility evolve its own universe like the multiple worlds people or something like that? Uh, Roger said that uh, the, the that superpositions were unstable and would self collapse. And to do that, he brought in uh, general relativity to solve a problem in quantum mechanics. This was another tour de force, you might say, because general relativity and quantum mechanics don't mix. Um, generally, general relativity deals with the large things and quantum deals with the small things. But at some point, they they meet. Uh, black, black holes are one area, which has led to a lot of interesting research. But he said... Um, in general relativity, uh, Einstein uh, suggested, and then it was later proven by Eddington, that space-time is curved by mass, or curvature creates mass, or maybe they're equivalent. So Einstein said, well, a star behind the sun could be seen on Earth because it's going to go around due to the curvature of the space-time around the sun, and we could see it here on Earth. And Eddington did that experiment during an eclipse and saw stars known to be behind the sun and proved space-time was curved. And Roger applied this not just to big things, but to small things. So a tiny particle, a quantum particle that could be in superposition uh, of both here and there, uh, he said it has a tiny curvature here. And then if it's over here, it has a tiny curvature here. So the superposition was up opposing curvatures or separation in space-time geometry, the, the very fine scale structure of the universe. And, uh, and so he tied, and that, but these separations, you can imagine these separations, if one they each went off, we'd have multiple worlds. Each one would form its own universe. But he said these separations in space-time, and he used these two-dimensional space-time sheets to illustrate, would, would be unstable and would self-collapse after time t to one or the other. And the larger the superposition, the faster they'd collapse. And uh, 
And, and here was the kicker, when that happened, when the, this objective reduction occurred due to this process in space-time geometry, there would be a moment of conscious experience or proto-conscious experience since it was isolated and disconnected. So rather than consciousness causing collapse, he was saying collapse causes spontaneously due to a property of the universe and gives rise to consciousness. So he was putting consciousness as a process in the very fine scale structure of the universe. And uh, that was its origin. And uh, uh, so that was an amazing, an amazing conclusion and statement, which nobody believed or didn't want to believe or couldn't, couldn't fathom or just waved off for various reasons. But it remains the, on, the only actual scientific proposal for what you called correctly the hard problem, which is Chalmers' term for why we have a qualia, sensations, feelings of pink, love, joy, whatever it is, the taste of coffee, you know, why, which is different from the easy problems like uh, memory, attention, behavior, which aren't really that easy, but compared to the hard problem, they are. And, uh, and so, uh, Roger was saying that that derives from a fine fine scale uh, space time geometry at the Planck scale, giving rise to these little moments of of, of awareness. Uh, but they would be random and, and isolated and and uh, disconnected, kind of like if you go to the symphony and and uh, each musician is tuning his or her instrument, you hear all this noise, and then that's kind of proto conscious moments here, there, and everywhere. Uh, conscious noise, you might say, and that would have to be going on in the environment and in inanimate objects and in our cells, other than the brain, all over the place. Um, but then you need something to orchestrate them to produce music. So the difference between the, the proto-conscious noise that would come from random uh, uh, collapses all over the place to our consciousness would involve orchestrating, orchestrating uh, these uh, individual moments into something more like a symphony or or the Beatles or whatever kind of music you like. Well, and, you know, if I could jump in for a moment. So, uh, you know, what he's basically talking about is a form of panpsychism, right? And this idea that the entire yeah. universe is conscious on some level. And obviously that's going to be more refined. And as you've mentioned, it's going to be orchestrated in the human mind, but it never fades completely out to zero right so there would be sparks of proto-consciousness as you described it like in a rock or an empty space even right it, but they're not able to really do anything uh what is interesting i've done recent interviews that have touched on this as well uh, the idea of panpsychism goes back a long way and so really what what you guys are describing is a mechanism for something that many many very well-respected scientists and philosophers. I believe even Albert Einstein supported this idea to some degree. So, yes, uh, panpsychism goes way back, and uh, it's still very prop, uh, uh, popular. And uh, a lot of neuroscientists who've kind of given up on explaining it with the brain say, "Well, it, then you then we bring in panpsychism." Um, but the problem with panpsychism is it's usually expressed as that it it it, it deals with matter. Uh, with with consciousness or qualia as a property of of matter, and the first question is: Is that uh, an atom? Is that an electron? Is it a molecule? Is it a quark? Is it a gluon? What level of matter are the uh, is the consciousness or proto consciousness or qualia attached to? Uh, the the second problem is the so called combination problem. Of what I'm, uh, what I described as orchestration, but how do you get from individual uh, conscious experiences here, there, and everywhere into the kind that we have? In quantum, that's easy because you have quantum entanglement and, and coherence. But if if it's classical, then you just have a bunch of stuff. Uh, but the 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 other problem with panpsychism is that all those uh, mole all those atoms or or particles, whatever they are, are constantly uh, going into superposition. And and according to Roger, at least reaching threshold and having objective reduction in these little moments, and 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 so they become they're classical quantum collapse the classical quantum collapse the they're they're oscillating uh, between quantum and classical, constantly going in and out of quantum states, and panpsychism doesn't deal with that. Um, they just deal with a, a kind of a static condition. So uh, our our view, I think, is is more basic and more uh, scientific. It's kind of pan protopsychism in that mm, uh, there's okay. a, there's the uh yeah the, the collapses are are proto conscious but they're everywhere and uh, now this you know 
idealists would say that everything is conscious and they and they have like uh cosmic intelligence or consciousness behind it and uh our pan protopsychism doesn't give us that although i don't rule that out through various means it um it what we're saying is that the microtubules in the brain are arranged a particular way to orchestrate these random moments into the kind of uh, consciousness that we have. Ah, okay. Well, so I want to touch on your books again, because we've, we've covered so much already. So the, the idea of microtubules in general, right, this initial kernel of an idea, this was in Ultimate Computing, which you published back in 1987. And then your collaboration with Sir Roger Penrose, that came out in Shadows of the Mind, Search for the Missing Science of Consciousness, which was published later. I believe that was in the, the mid uh, what, what, 2000s. 94, right? I think. Yeah, that oh, was just okay. when we were getting started. And he did mention me and describe a little bit about our work, but we hadn't really developed the model yet. Uh, that uh, that came out in uh, uh, 95, 96. Actually, the full model came out in 1996. Uh, so there were little glimmerings of it in Shadows of the Mind, and I was grateful he mentioned me, but we, we hadn't started yet. In fact, it's an interesting story because um, we started... Uh, so I, I wrote to him and suggested that microtubules might be the quantum device he was looking for to implement this uh, objective reduction. And uh, I kind of invited myself to visit him since I was going to be in England, and he graciously agreed. And so uh, I basically told him that the uni uh, neurons are too big, which he knew already, and you need uh, something uh, smaller and faster. And microtubules are perfectly uh, suited and already have hints of quant quantum effects and can regulate neur neurons from below. So it's, it's, a, it's a deeper more basic uh, level. And he, he he liked the idea and he particularly liked the uh, uh, microtubule A lattice, which had Fibonacci geometry because he, he geometry is his real basic uh, uh, basic go-to uh, science. And uh, so the Fibonacci geometry gives you all the symmetry and whatnot. So um, anyway, we, we started to develop a model to think, figure out how many microtubules you needed for consciousness and this and that. It was very slow going, and his wife Vanessa said, "I just want to uh, alert you that this collaboration with Roger is a very tedious process." And uh, so we we were moving on very very slowly, and then um, somebody uh, ambushed us. Uh, uh, a um, philosopher at uh, UCSD, Patricia Churchland, a well known philosopher of mine, and her graduate student Rick Rush. Oh, let, let me go back when when uh, Roger when we first met. Roger said he was going to a conference at Cambridge with. Patricia Churchland, Dan Dennett, and some other people. And I said, well, that sounds like fun. But uh, I had to go to another another conference. And uh, when I came back, I had dinner with a friend of mine in London. He said, hey, I went to this conference at Cambridge, and Roger Penrose was talking about you and your stupid microtubules. And I was like thrilled. I'm going, really? Because I thought, yeah, well, that was nice. I got to meet Roger. But uh, yeah, I didn't think. I, I could only hope it would continue. So obviously it did. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, one day uh, we got a uh, got an email or a, a phone, I forget, from uh, the ed publisher of Journal of Consciousness Studies that Pat Churchland and her graduate student Rick Rush had written an attack piece against our theory even before it was published. And uh, they made fun of Roger's uh, Penrose tilings, where you can tile a plane with five-fold symmetry. And uh, they called it Gaps and Penrose's Toilings. Torlings meaning his efforts, which is yeah, an okay pun. <laughs> Excuse me. But um, the first half uh, ridiculed his Girdle's theorem argument, and the second half ridiculed the microtubule idea. And uh, the uh, the publisher said, well we'll, well, we'll give you an opportunity to uh, write a response in the next issue, but we need a manuscript in two weeks. And I thought to myself, wow, it's been a year. We don't have a manuscript. So how's this going to work? But um, uh, uh, Roger suggested uh, he was sufficiently annoyed by this uh, paper that uh, we we kind of put it on a fast track. And he said, uh, he said, I'll answer the first part about the Girdle's theorem. You answer the stuff about the microtubules. We'll put them together. We'll write the abstract together. And so we did. And so um, the, you know, he answered about Girdle's theorem and I answered about microtubules, which, for example, their objection was uh, uh, there's a drug called colchicine used for gout. So in gout, where your your big toe inflames, it's um, you eat rich foods, the purines, purines, you get these uric crystals inside a joint, and they attract uh, lymphocytes and white macrophages, uh, immune cells into this joint, 
to deal with it. And they release all these toxins and the whole thing swells up and that causes pain, really pain, real bad pain. And uh, one way to treat it is to use colchicine, which paralyzes the lymphocytes and macrophages from getting into the joint. You know, just leave the urate crystals alone. They're not going to harm anything. It's the inflammation that causes the problem. So if you paralyze the immune systems, uh, immune cells that can't get into the joint and therefore your gout gets better. So they said, well, aha, uh, colchicine depolymerizes microtubules, but when you take it, you don't lose consciousness. So you guys are full of, full of garbage, you know? And uh, I said, well, th this was easy because I knew all about colchicine. And I, I told them, number one, colchicine only, only works on uh, microtubules that are rapidly uh, disassembling and reassembling, like in, uh, in a, a cell uh, movement. And uh, those in the brain uh, are stable, the, particularly in dendrites where they're capped and, and they don't treadmill, they don't depolymerize. The, so they wouldn't be affected, number one. Uh, number two, colchicine doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. Uh, and number three, in an animal study I found where they injected colchicine into the brain of an animal, it just wiped them out. They were like um, uh, severely impaired from the damage from the colchicine. So um, uh, I answered that and there were a few other silly questions. And uh, so we published it. And uh, actually it was kind of funny because um, they were really rude in their in their paper. They, they were insulting. And if you know Pat Churchland, you know, that's just how she is. Uh, and uh, they said, they basically uh, accused us of, uh, uh, oh, they said that their theory, Penrose Amaral theory is no better supported than one in a gazillion caterpillar with hookah hypotheses mm. from Alice in Wonderland. So they were insinuating something. And uh, uh, so it was kind of rude. And in the end of our paper, we said, it's not that we're in Wonderland, perhaps their heads are in the sand. Like they were like ostriches with their heads buried in the sand and weren't, weren't seeing the truth, which I think is, is basically the situation. Anyway, the Journal of Consciousness Studies, uh, bless their hearts, uh, published our paper in response. And they made a cartoon. They said, can we use this cartoon that we got this artist to do? And it was a cartoon of, uh, of on the outside, me and Roger. And uh, I'm, on, I'm on the left side and uh, I'm the caterpillar with hookah sitting on top of a mushroom. And on the other side is Roger with the, with the uh, keys to the platonic realm in a, in a rabbit suit, the white rabbit. And in between are two uh, scrawny ostriches with their big butts pointing at the viewer with G and C for Gresham Churchland on them with their heads buried in the sand. And I'm blowing the hookah smoke right up their butt. And uh, I thought that was actually pretty, pretty funny. And uh, uh, Roger and I were at a meeting at the, I think the Fetzer Institute when they, they fa I said, well, fax it to us. We have to see it. And they faxed it to us. And I started laughing. And I looked at Roger and I, I didn't think he was going to go for it. He says, okay, fine. So they did publish it and it's, it's still out there and uh, it, it's a pretty funny thing. So uh, that was a great moment in consciousness studies, that cartoon, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, this raises so many questions and I, we don't have time for all of them today, but I mean, what, so one of the big ones, I, I guess, is if microtub, if microtubules are involved in information processing, does that mean that every cell in the body might be in some ways performing some of the tasks that we've formally only attributed to the brain. Not necessarily, because um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, remember that uh, there's these uh, proto-conscious moments happening here, there, and everywhere, regardless of microtubules. And microtubules could could have uh, the, these kind of moments without full-blown consciousness, because, well, first of all, um, collapse occurs according to... Uh, Roger's theory, uh, or theory, at a time T equals H bar over E sub G. So it's a very, one one equation. And it's a form of the uncertainty principle where uh, T is the time which the collapse occurs. H bar is Planck's constant over two pi over E sub G, which is the gravitational self energy of the superposition. So imagine you have a, a, a mass that's gonna go in superposition, an atom, let's say, or an atomic nucleus and you separate it from itself, so it's literally be beside itself, you can calculate the energy that that takes to separate it. And once it's it's completely separated beside itself, you can separate it a lot more and it doesn't require much much more energy, if, if any. So it, once it gets complete separation, it's, it's one equation. So you can, um, <clears throat> you can calculate that. So 
we calculated it for uh, for tubulin, uh, tubulins and, and microtubules based on uh, carbon atom nuclei being separated from themselves. And uh, uh, and then we figured out for a, a conscious moment of a particular time, T, uh, how many microtubules would you need in superposition to reach threshold? And originally we used T to be physiological times like uh, 40 Hertz, 25 milliseconds or EEG. Uh, 100 milliseconds or so for alpha excuse me um but that uh that's that's a long time to avoid decoherence and uh it also would only involve a small amount of the brain for for these long times so um in our in our re revised orco after the uh, after the uh, molecular atomic structure of, of tubulin became known with all these aromatic rings and pi electron resonance orbitals that were triggering the quantum quantum effects, um, we we decided that the orca war events had to be of a much greater frequency. And in the meantime, an astounding an astounding discovery had been made by Anurban Bandyapadye in, in Japan at National Institute of Material Sciences studying microtubules. Now, he was a, uh, a nanotechnologist and he had built atomic, uh, was trying to build an atomic uh, computer, molecular computer. And he started reading uh, uh, our work and started studying microtubules. And he found that microtubules have resonances and vi coherent vibrations. And he used a uh, nanoprobe. So imagine you have one microtubule and you put four, four probes on it, two to stimulate and two to record. If you put a voltage across it, it's an insulator. There's no current flow. However, if you put, if you start uh, a, a, a alternating uh, voltage and, and sweep the frequency, you get certain frequencies where there's this huge bump in, in conductance. And uh, and he 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 did it uh, over 12 orders of magnitude, uh, starting from hertz uh, to kilohertz, megahertz, uh, gigahertz, and terahertz. And he found that every three orders of magnitude, there would be this peak of conductance, uh, almost exactly every three orders of magnitude. And each peak was actually three peaks, and each of those peaks was three peaks. So it was triplets of triplets. So he found triplets of triplets every three orders of magnitude and uh, of conductance. And it was close to superconductive, not, not quite because there was a classical interface with the, with the probes. But he found quantum effects in other ways. For example, the conductance through individual uh, tubulins was less than through a whole microtubule. So there was a collective... Uh, quantum effect and and the effect was also temperature independent the, this this says that it's quantum but these uh conductances in uh kilohertz megahertz uh gigahertz and terahertz were quite quite remarkable and, and very self similar in shape suggesting some kind of fractal uh or holographic arrangement uh, going inside the neuron and people say well if you go deeper then you, it's just more reductionist more reductionist but once you hit the quantum level, you get non-locality and entanglement. You can you can entangle the whole brain. And Honorbaum's recently um, uh, shown entanglement between microtubules in a paper that's in press. It should be out in a couple of weeks, and uh, that'll be that'll be really exciting. And I would love to do the experiment and see if anesthesia takes away the entanglement between microtubules because I think you need that for consciousness and binding and so forth. So um, the point is that that in that that you know everybody. I'm kind of I'm kind of uh, uh, picking a fight with neuroscience uh, on Twitter right now, and because uh, I think neuro the neuroscience of consciousness is an insult to neurons, because they continue to treat neurons as empty, as uh, they only look at the membrane activities, the the dendritic potential, trigger the spike, the action potential, synaptic uh, vesicle, and that's it, uh, strictly membrane only stuff. Uh, ignoring all the stuff, uh, the microtubules that's going on, and ignoring the twelve orders of magnitude of self-similar vibrational uh, uh, conductances and resonances that almost for sure go into the quantum realm. Also, so they're dealing, you know, at EEG frequencies, uh, hertz and and maybe a hundred hertz, uh, and they're ignoring the the kilohertz, megahertz, gigahertz, terahertz going on. And within the neuron and within all these neurons collectively, and we think EEG actually comes from these microtubule vibrations as beat frequencies of much faster vibrations in say in megahertz. So they're slightly off and they get beat frequencies that cascade uh, downward in frequency to give you EEG. So there's all this stuff going on and the neuroscience 
uh, people in terms of how the brain works in, in cognition and consciousness ignore all that and just look at uh, each neuron as a simple on-off state, an integrated uh, threshold logic device, so basically the Hodgkin Huxley integrate and fire. And, and even that fails because neurons, for example, pyramidal neurons in awake animals uh, are not algorithmic. They're not integrate and fire. There's a deviation from algorithmic Hodgkin-Huxley behavior in pyramidal neurons of awake animals. And uh, this, this is a very likely place for consciousness to come in. If everything's algorithmic, we're all zombies on autopilot, no free will, no creativity, uh, no nothing as far as I, I mean, we'd just be uh, like AIs and uh, which is a whole nother question. But um, but yet uh, there's deviation from Hodgkin Huxley behavior and from algorithmic behavior, which is where consciousness would be the perfect location and time to come in to deviate our behavior. Let's say you're driving and, and you're on autopilot and all of a sudden somebody swerves and you're all of a sudden conscious and you take over. Consciousness comes up and, and assumes control of otherwise auto, auto autopilot and just like or an airplane the, the pilot takes over when there's when there's turbulence so i think that's that's that consciousness comes from a lower lower uh lower but faster uh more high high capacity information processing in the microtubules including including quantum effects that, that give give you the hard problem so um uh neuroscience is ignoring this all all the other theories of consciousness other than ours just look at these cartoon neurons and uh, it's an insult to neurons. And, um, you know, it's going back to the days of uh, where all the cytoskeleton was dissolved and it was like a watery soup. It's not. It's a highly ordered uh, solid state pericrystalline uh, uh, medium, which includes in dendrites and soma, very unique uh, mixed polarity networks of microtubules. Everywhere else, they're like spokes of a wheel for structural support. But in the dendrites and soma, they're broken and interrupted and you wouldn't for skeletal support, you, you wouldn't want to break them. And that gives rise to interference. So we think that um, in the dendrites and soma, particularly of layer five pyramidal cells, uh, they're interfering, giving rise to consciousness. Ah, well, do you think that this explains uh, these hints, I guess, coming from like the parapsychology community and stuff like the global consciousness project that are saying that there are some kind of group quantum effects in the mind, right? Like um, with Roger Nelson and Dean Radin, um, it seems that their research is hinting that there are quantum effects in the mind that connect to quantum effects in other minds, um, you know, and that that leads to non-locality. It leads to potentially information transfer. That's That's what it seems to indicate. Um, you know, Roger Nelson's Global Consciousness Project, um, what they're they're cross correlating, right, major news events with changes in, in random events. All of this comes back to what appears to be quantum behavior. Right. And I, I mean, all of it is also, you know, open to interpretation and, and possible experimental error. But there are a lot of things that seem to come back to this idea of quantum mind right which is something that i know that you know the new age movement has picked up and given kind of a questionable reputation as well do you think that microtubules can explain this in a more scientific way yes i do uh you're talking about non-locality which is a pandora's box in neuroscience and believe me neuroscience doesn't want to go there because hmm. once they once they admit or consider or take seriously non-locality um their whole idea of you know the cartoon neuron is dead. Uh, Hodgkin Huxley is dead. There's got to be something else, and there has to be something else. And the microtubules are the likely medium for quantum non-locality in the brain, which can explain telepathy, precognition, uh, temporal spatial temporal non-locality, the uh, the global uh, effects uh, because those random number generators are quantum quantum things. Yeah. And so they can be entangled and uh, even uh, the remote viewing and all that stuff. So I, I think it's all, and well, why not throw in afterlife and out of body experiences and all that? I mean, once you've got non local consciousness, non locality and consciousness, you know, all bets are off. And so yeah. I don't rule out, you know, afterlife or reincarnation or astral projection, any of that stuff. I don't, you know, uh, proclaim it or, 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 claim i have any evidence i don't i just say that you can't exclude it and you should be looking at it as as data not as something to be you know avoided uh, i think uh, neuroscientists are afraid of it quite frankly 
Well, and, you know, I think the way that I'm kind of looking at it is it, I, I think that you've made an excellent point. Um, it's difficult to, you know, even begin to prove a lot of that. And a lot of that is completely outside of the scope of your research, right? But it is interesting to say that the mind seems capable of so much more than we've given it credit for, right? I think you talked about Hodgkin Huxley, where we've envisioned it almost as like a binary computer. It's like a neuron fires, a signal is sent and then received. And, you know, we have this spark, I guess, of consciousness from that. And what you're saying is this could be orders of magnitude, potentially many orders of magnitude, faster and deeper. And the types of connections, the types of decisions that are made could be happening inside of the cells, right? And so the human mind could be much, much, much smarter, more complex, and capable of more things, potentially like non-locality, than we've given it credit for. Yes, absolutely. Um, if you if you think of this as a, a, high, a scale invariant hierarchy, uh, where if you know you have EEG, you know uh, hertz to hundred hertz maybe, and then you're going down smaller, you get faster. So you get kilohertz, a uh, uh, thousand, then a, a million, a megahertz, gigahertz, billion, terahertz, a uh, trillion, so forth. And uh, and I think as you uh, as you become more conscious, whether you meditate or effects of psychedelics, uh, consciousness, since E equals H over T or T equals H bar over E sub G, it's same same equation, can happen at different levels. Uh, as you go deeper, T gets smaller. I think the intensity of the experience gets greater. Uh, so there's more content. There's more, uh, there's more con capacity, more uh, moments per second. So everything gets more intense consciously. So I think as you go uh, faster and, and smaller, uh, you get more and more conscious, more, you know, there is a line from a Beatles song, the deeper you go, the higher you fly, the higher you fly, the deeper you go. I think in a sense, that's true. As you go deeper into the into this hierarchy and deeper into the quantum world and get into non-locality and more intense experience, that's more conscious. And it could be that if you keep going and you're going to run out of biology and you're going to be having a, a quantum events in space-time geometry, uh, which is possible and could stay entangled uh, by through entanglement into some kind of quantum soul or something like that. You know, I don't make a, I don't make a big deal about that, but you can't roll that out. I mean, I've been asked about near death and out of body experiences and uh, you know, I'm a, I'm an anesthesiologist and, you know, the, you know, People have cardiac arrests and and some of the great the studies. I've never done those studies, but people who study them uh, talk about you know the the near death and out experience, which is very reproducible. The white light and and dead relatives and the sense of calm calmness and serenity. You know, people write oh they're just hypoxic. You know, well I, I've seen a lot of hypoxic patients and they're not calm. They are very anxious. So it's not that. And um, you know it's. And then there's this evidence from end of life brain activity where the patient dies, you put this brain monitor on, there's a burst of gamma activity just as as the heart rate, as the heart stops and that sort of thing. So I think there's a lot to understand about this. And and neuroscience with their cartoon neurons and strictly classical algorithmic are missing a lot. And um in you know, I'm I'm retiring from my uh my uh anesthesia job and I'm gonna be spending a lot of time writing and doing research and and uh a teaching actually, I'm teaching a class in physics of consciousness at the University of Arizona. We got we we've been uh, giving classes the last couple of years and got approved for an undergraduate minor in consciousness studies. Mm. So uh, Tom Bever's been in charge of that, and Dante Loretta is involved, and we have a really good good group, and we'll be uh, starting that up uh, over the summer and the fall. Wonderful, Stuart. Thank you so much for your time today. It is a true pleasure and a true honor to have you with me. So uh, let me close by asking. It sounds like what comes next for you then is retirement and you're going to be doing more research and teaching, right? Um, what do you expect to be coming in the, for the remainder of 2023? Well, one of the things I'm trying to do is to uh, 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 is a treatment for Alzheimer's disease. And uh, this is another pet peeve of mine that I think neuroscience is really screwed up. Um, you know, I mentioned that neuroscience is ignoring what's, what goes on inside the neuron. And this carries over to the Alzheimer's tragically. You know, there's there's two lesions in Alzheimer's. There's the, the amyloid plaques, which are outside the neurons, these big, ugly globs of beta amyloid. Um, 
which get all the money for research. And so they develop these drugs, which are antibodies, and they go and they nibble away or they, they do something to the amyloid. And they may reduce the amyloid, but they don't do a damn thing for the cognition or memory. Patients do not get better. Uh, their brain scans might uh, might look better or, when, or their autopsy might look better, but it didn't help their cognition. On the other, th there's also these lesions inside the neurons that are called neurofibrillary tangles, which is where tau protein, tau is a microtubule associated protein, normally sitting on the microtubule, stabilizing it, and also acting as a traffic signal for motor proteins that move along and tell them where to get off and, and deliver their synaptic cargo. And uh, so uh, the tau gets dislodged from the microtubules and forms these clumps called neurofibrillary tangles inside the neurons. And the microtubules fall apart. Now, it's unclear whether the tau falls off and then the microtubules fall apart, the microtubules fall apart, then the tau falls off. In either case, you have these clumps of tau and you, you lost microtubules, they disassemble. So you lose synapses because the, the neuron retreats. You lose neural volume because you're losing micro, you're losing neuronal volume because the micro, it's like if your bones disintegrated, you'd just be like a bunch of jelly on the floor. So as the microtubules um, disassemble, the neuron sort of collapses, not quantum collapses, but just shrinks and shrivels up and you lose brain volume and the brain atrophies, you know, Alzheimer's, the brain shrinks. And, uh, and that's most, most likely entirely due to microtubule disassembly. So what do you do about it? Well, um, uh, there's, there's a drug called Epothalone D that stabilizes microtubules. It's been shown to be beneficial in animals, but it's still a drug and it's got to cross the blood brain barrier. Um, I started when, when I learned about honor bonds work, uh, around, uh, 2000, 2009 actually contacted me. Um, he eventually, as I said, showed uh, uh, kilohertz, megahertz, gigahertz, terahertz in microtubules. And I thought maybe one of those frequencies could be used to resonate microtubules. Well, terahertz is photons and people actually do photons, uh, put photons into the brain through the, through the skull, through the nose and seem to have some beneficial effect in, in, in dementia. Um, gigahertz is microwave. So I wasn't interested in doing that. Uh, megahertz in e EM is radio waves. I wasn't interested in doing that, but in, um, uh, in mechanical waves, megahertz is ultrasound. And I was very familiar with ultrasound because we use it in anesthesia. We use it in medicine. There's like hundreds of them all over the hospital. And I wondered if anybody had put ultrasound into the brain as a, and sure enough, a guy at ASU had been doing it in animals, a guy named Jamie Tyler. And uh, it was approved for brain imaging uh, before CT and MRI. So it couldn't be that bad. And they were still using it for newborns into the uh, fontanelle to look for uh, for uh, uh, bleeds in, in babies. So very well, how bad can it be? So um, I told my friends, uh, my anesthesia colleagues, you know, uh, we have this pain clinic, we have our pain clinic and we have all these patients are depressed. We should try transcranial ultrasound and see if they 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 get feel better. And they go, <laughs> yeah, right, Hammer, you you got to shave dad your idea go right ahead we'll watch you and so they they call my bluff and um so one day at the end of a, a long day in the OR, we're sitting around the conference table i said okay so i put the thing up to my head like this with the gel on it and held it for about 15 per second uh 15 seconds and i'm right-handed so i put it there and this is the thinnest part of the bone i didn't feel anything so i was disappointed i put it down but about a minute later i got kind of a buzz for a couple hours and i said we should try this on our pain patients and so we did in, in early 2013, published the first paper on effects of brain ultrasound on mental states in humans. And since then, uh, there's been a lot of studies showing mood improvement and rewiring and, and inducing mindfulness and this and that. Uh, but most of them went to uh, focused. And now they're they're using the ultrasound to, uh, to target particular areas, which is great. But I'm not sure that's a, the best use of it. I think the study I did where you kind of literally shotgunned it into the brain and and, and got big swaths of the brain. Uh, why not get a, a whole bunch of the brain? So uh, then you don't need an MRI in advance. Then you don't need uh, stereotactic stuff. And you could take a handheld one. And, and if everybody agrees, go to nursing homes and go to our memory care centers, go from room to room and give everybody, you know, 30 seconds of ultrasound and then go to the next one, the next one. So that's the kind of study I, I want to organize. It kind of a, uh, uh, almost a barefoot doctor approach, uh, you know, ground up rather than these, uh, these drugs that cost $400,000 a year per patient to do something to the amyloid plaques, which don't help 
help their cognition. I mean, the FDA really screwed that badly. And um, uh, we, you know, we need a different approach. This whole precision genetic uh, medicine thing is, it's great for certain people, but it's missing the masses. It's missing, you know, everybody else. So uh, I kind of like this idea. We're trying to get it, uh, get it supported through uh, either the U University of Arizona or uh, a place in California called the California Institute for Human Science, which is into the sort of thing. And, uh, and so that I'll be doing that hopefully. And I'm also working with uh, my friend Dante Loretta, who is a uh, planetary scientist who's in charge of the Osiris Rex project, which sent a, uh, a space probe to this asteroid um, and scooped up some material and is bringing it back, hopefully with carbonaceous organic material to look for the origin of life and consciousness. And Dante is a big expert in the origin of life. And he got the idea uh, that consciousness must and, and, and life must be closely associated. Because I mean, I, are they really just looking for life or are they looking for con consciousness out there? I mean, they're looking for consciousness. They, they just, people don't want to say it, intelligent life or whatever. So, um, and in my view, consciousness came first, actually. Roger's objective reduction was happening in the universe before, before life. And I have a paper about uh, the quantum origin of life where in the primordial soup, these OR events started happening and they started having these uh, proto-conscious moments, including some that were pleasurable. And this was a feedback fitness function that led to the origin and development of life. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in my opinion, the evolution still to this day is driven by seeking pleasure and avoiding displeasure in all of its forms, not necessarily just hedonism, but altruism, uh, spiritual, whatever, uh, whatever makes you feel good. That's what drives our behavior. I mean, that goes for rats in a maze or whatever. So I, you know, I think, you know, gene survival doesn't make any sense if, unless genes can feel things. I mean, what, what's the motivation? So I think consciousness, uh, was there and caused the origin of life, uh, and is, is, um, uh, is driving its evolution to optimize, uh, pleasure in some sense. So anyway, uh, we're uh, working with Dante. We're going to develop that idea and and look for the origin. And if we get some of these or, and, and these aromatic rings that give rise to quantum effects in microtubules are throughout the universe. They're in the they're called uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, and they're in the interstellar dust. And uh, they can uh, they may be entangled. They may be uh, and they they radiate. They may be somehow talking to each other, uh, even as we speak. So. I think there's a lot we don't know. I think, uh, I think, um, um, you know, like I said, I think neuroscience is barking up the wrong tree, beating the same dead horse uh, for both con understanding consciousness, Alzheimer's. They can't explain memory because uh, synaptic proteins last hours to days and memories last, last lifetimes. Microtubules are likely uh, sort sites of memory storage. Uh, they can't explain binding. They can't explain free will because consciousness comes too late. Um, uh, Neuroscience really can't explain much in terms of consciousness, memory, binding, and certainly nothing non-local. So, um, you know, but, you know, they've got the, the voice of authority and uh, I'm at the stage of my career where I don't care. So I'm going to I'm going to fight back and be a, be an annoyance because I think they need it. <laughs> amazing. Amazing. Stuart, again, thank you so much for your time today. Hey, you're welcome, Tim, and keep up the good work. I appreciate you.